Okay, welcome back to Fast Ship Performance there. My name's Tim Davies. And I thought I would put a few things out that I've written online today. Kind of helps people really, isn't it? Um, saves you having to go to Facebook or Cora to read them. And I'm also going to talk to you about Aerolis, which is a company that I'm the strategy director for having left the Royal Air Force now. And I really want to talk to you about this. It's exciting. And seriously, there's an investment opportunity here for you as well. And I'm only reason, uh, I'm, the only reason I'm saying that is because I've invested in it because I believe in it. All right. It's a fresh, I say fresh, it's actually reasonably mature as um, a very small engineering company that's looking out to disrupt the current aviation industry and all the people in this company at the moment. And it's getting quite big now uh, that they've all been involved in aviation for many, many years, whether it's in aerospace design, whether it's in piloting like myself, whether it's in courseware design, whether it's structural analysis, um, whatever it might be. It's a very good team and all the ages range, well, pretty much upwards from me, I guess. I think there's some guys there um, and a few ladies there that are younger than me, but generally, you know, the, the age group is very experienced, very mature. So I want to talk to you about that a bit later. But first, there's two things um, we're going to cover. I don't expect this to be too long as a podcast, to be honest with you. But there's um, some advice for commercial pilots struggling with confidence issues. That's a pretty cool email that was written to me. Uh, I do say to people, if you want to write to me, do it. It's very hard for me to give you an individual answer that I can't socialize to the group because you can imagine how many people out there are writing to me every day. Um, I could literally, I should do that one day. I just literally read you the, the emails, titles, and the Twitter uh, things and everything else, Facebook connection messages, all that kind of stuff that I get of a day. Just the different, the variety. It's interesting. It's interesting. But of course, how do I get back to everyone? And what I try and do, of course, is socialize my answers to the fast hit performance on, on Facebook. So uh, primarily, or on Twitter so that everyone can learn from the response. Some people write to me and they say, um, Tim, I, I don't want you to uh, use this for anything else. And well, that's great. But if it's a really big answer that you need, I'm going to find that difficult because it's a time issue. And you know that, especially if you're a young guy, you know, I, I don't really have much time at the moment. I'm exceptionally busy. Um, that said, uh, I will do everything I can. If it's a personal issue, I'm not, if it's a personal issue, you know, I'm not going to socialize that. Of course I'm not, I'm not stupid like that. If it's like, uh, like this, this question here, then yeah, I will. I'll take a name out of it and I'll use it for the group, okay? Anyway, this guy here was great. Uh, he really understands the benefit of socializing failure. Um, not that he has failed, but um, he understands that. And what he's done is he's uh, said, yeah, please use that so other people can benefit. So I've written back to him. And then the second thing I wrote to uh, was to Cora in response to a, um, a question that was asked, which was, is being a fight pilot really as romantic and awesome as it is in the movies? What are the downsides? Well, I'm the guy to tell you that, right? I'm the guy to tell you that indeed, having been there. Okay. And then obviously we're going to talk a little bit about Aerolis because uh, I really want to start kind of mentioning what I'm doing there with the company, what the company is um, working towards. Um, I can't really tell you who we're working with at the moment because a lot of these companies aren't on contract, but they're big. They're big companies. Um, this is not a small startup. This is really not. When you when you find out what's happening with this, the amount of money that's been invested, you realize that it's going to go ahead. It's happening. Things are going to get built. That's very exciting. Let's start off then. Let's start off, shall we, with... Here we are. Right, so then, this uh, was on Facebook. Uh, a lot of people don't use Facebook, so I thought I'd put it out on this podcast as well. And this was a guy had written to me, and um, pretty much I said, you know, I always remove the names, uh, but this guy's doing the right thing. So just ask for advice. That's all I'm saying. If you have a problem out there, especially with to do with issues in your, you know, the way you're working, the way you're progressing in careers, whatever, then then just ask. You know, we've all been there before, right? That's the thing. So I like to think that I can mentor people that are struggling. That's what I do with the coaching anyway, which is I'm having to charge quite a bit for at the moment because I'm I've got quite a few people. So it's taking up a lot of time. Okay, let's go then. <clears throat> right. So he starts off with Hi Tim. Always good. Uh, wondering if you'd be kind enough for some advice. Uh, feel free to share this as it may help others. Yesterday was my first attempt at the multi-engine instrument rating skills test. I've completed a 55-hour course at a good flight school in the UK and have not struggled with it. Some bits were hard to get at first, having gone from the world of VFR, uh, which is visual flight rules, but no more than for me than anyone else with no experience. Okay, uh, I was fortunate enough to get a test route somewhere I've been before a few times and a friendly examiner, which is always important. Despite this, I was unbelievably nervous. I prepared well on the ground and briefed well, but as soon as we got airborne, the standard on my flying was average to poor. Nothing unsafe, but I'm much better than that on any other day. Long story short, I achieved a partial pass. 
Panicked on the ILS and went around too early and was also at the wrong height at the start. Now I have to just do that aspect again, just an ILS. Clearly I'm capable of this. I have the skill. I've done it probably 20 times without help from my instructor, but how on the earth do I now control my nerves and perform well on the next attempt? As soon as we take off, I feel like I've become a passenger. I feel glazed over and almost like I'm not in command. It's bizarre. To add some context, I'm a doctor who's decided after seven years to change career. My dad's a commercial pilot, so that adds to the pressure of all of this. I'm worrying now that I don't have what it takes and I have to get this right on the retest or I have to fail this series and do all aspects again. Thanks for your time. Uh, if you'd keep this unnamed, I'd be grateful. And of course I kept it unnamed. I mean, yeah, absolutely. No worries. If you write to me, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not here to embarrass people. Jesus, not that it's embarrassing. This guy hasn't done anything wrong, right? He's done exactly the right thing. He's like, I've got issues with nerves. What's that about? Why am I nervous when I fly? Okay, well, this is what I responded to him. And then we'll talk this out a little bit. So I said to him, well, thanks for the cue. I never mentioned names on anything personal, but I appreciate that you see the value in this for others. That's the medic in you coming out. Okay, it's pretty straightforward, really, although it's clear to me that your struggle is as real as it ever can be for you. This is just what flying is all about, mastery. Not just mastery of the aircraft, however. You'll get there eventually. I can get anyone to fly fast jets if I had enough time with them. The truth is that we never had enough time. The syllabus was a certain length. Students only got so many sims and flights and people would fail trips. It's done that way on purpose. We can't afford to just train anyone. We have to select the best we can so that people in fast jets can deal with all the complexities that await them. In fact, students were allowed to refly about 10% of the flying course before they were removed. It's harsh but fair. It has to be that way as there isn't an unlimited pot of flying hours with which to train people. So, as I said, we could get you through the flying course if you had more hours. And let's be as honest as you are being right now. You may just need more hours. You know that, and there's nothing wrong with having a few more hours. You were a doctor. Now, imagine that your kid has to go into surgery with a guy who was allowed to pass med school even though he wasn't competent. It's never going to happen. I'm sure you agree, and it's the same in aviation, thankfully. So this brings me to the last bit of the being a pilot puzzle. The main thing you absolutely need to understand about learning to fly is that you must attain mastery of yourself. What does this mean? Well, I can tell you I can tell that you are a lot closer to it than many pilots who write to me because you understand that you have an issue and that you need to sort out and you are correct. You get nervous pre-flight. You know what I'd have a real issue with? Is if you didn't. You're just the same as many pilots out there who are learning to fly. Nerves are there for a reason. They tell you that what you're about to do has value. You should cherish that and remember the sentence. That's why people get nervous public speaking because everybody is listening to them. They have an interest in what they are about to say. They value what is about to happen, what you are about to do. Having nerves is not just natural, but it's also very necessary. So I want you to think about it in that way. Your body and mind are telling you that what you are about to do is awesome. So wow, how lucky are you? And here's the great thing. The more you do it, the less nervous you'll become because you'll be becoming acclimatized to it. So try and appreciate the nerves now. That's just excitement running through you. Get a head start with reducing your nerves if you want to. Is what the Royal Air Force students do and it's called chair flying. I'm sure you've heard of it before. I still do this pre-meetings. If I have a deal to do, uh, like if I have a speaking event or even before I go to a new gym, the key is to walk through everything real time in your head prior to doing it for real. But I do that already. Yeah, sure you do. And you probably haven't even begun to understand the level that you can go to with this, but that's okay because I'm here to help. The key to chair flying is that you are trying to calm your nerves by getting yourself as exposed to the event that is triggering them as you possibly can. So take me with a new speaking event, right? I get asked to speak to a company. They're gonna pay about 2,000 pounds. So for me, that means about two days, maybe three days work that wouldn't be needed to be prepared for it. Before I even begin to prepare for the presentation, I research the environment. So I'll call up the venue and I'll look on their website. I'll use Google Earth to see the locations and I'll even view the entrance. I'll, I'll get as familiar as I can with the venue as possible. I'll even call the receptionist to see what it's like in that room that I'll be presenting in. I'll, I'll ask questions like, does it have windows? Is the floor carpeted? I'll ask about the number of people I'm presenting to. What do they all do? What are the facilities like? Is there parking? Do I have a projector? What's the sound setup, etc.? I mean, you get the idea. I might also call someone who has already spoken there before. I'll ask them what it was like. What would they do differently in their preparation if they had to speak there again? 
I need to be able to describe to somebody my entire journey from my house to the actual place I stand to present. And I mean in detail. I've chair flown the whole thing. I can describe how I feel as I walk into the hotel entrance, past reception, down the corridor, what the room looks like as I open the door, how many people there are, what ages they will be, and how they are arranged in the room. I go into some serious detail. So now I feel much less nervous than I would have done if I had done no prep. The key is prep. So for you, chair fly the flight until you're sick of it. Get into your flow state in your room. Move your hands as you change imaginary radio frequencies. Think about when you'll make those radio calls and what to do if you miss the localizer or are late with selecting your services. What's the comm that you must use to change, to change a missed ILS to a PAR or to state that you're going to go around for further approach? Get the comm nailed. It will free up capacity and that's the key. Now, the next time you fly, your body and mind will be much more prepared for it. You might still feel nervous, as I do sometimes when I speak, but you'll find the nerves go away much quicker because you're now more familiar with what you're doing. You understand that nerves are there to prepare you for something that is of value to you. Do some serious chair flying and get back in the jet with confidence. They need to see that you're developing captaincy and that takes ownership, which you already have. You'll get through your training, keep working at it with solid preparation, and it's just a matter of time. Right, that's the end. Okay, I'll look down the comments then, and we'll have a look. And there's some great guys, and I know some of these guys because they're airline mates of mine. Uh, there's some military guys on here. I can recognize names straight out. And they're putting in some comments, and that's really useful. So this is why, this is what people don't understand when they ask for my help. It's like, okay, so I'm busy, so I'm going to give you an answer, and you understand that. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it done for you because I, I believe in helping out people grow, and that's what mentoring is about. But if I put this on Facebook, you're going to get like 5,000 people's help. I mean, some serious people that are doing some serious things. You don't even know. When you look down the list of people that are commenting on these, these posts and everything, I look at names. You don't know who these people are. I know who these people are. I know what they're doing. I know the struggles they had. I know the jobs they're doing now. I know uh, I've got guys on here flying you know, um, 777 airliners. They're captains on those. I've got guys that are in military test programs. You think about the guys I've worked with and the, the great people that come to the site to contribute. These are the people that are going to add to that. So when you ask me, can you tell me this, but don't share this with anyone, I'm like, why would you not want people to help you out? Because I'm one guy and I've just seen one thing. And that's great. And I can give you my opinion. I will do that in an email. I'll, I'll write back to you if, you if you say that. That's fine. But listen, let's get these things out there. I'll take your name off it and we'll use these. Now, if it's going to expose you to something you don't want to be exposed for, you know I'm not going to do that. And as I said, I'll keep it one-on-one because -on -one uh, that's how you work. So next week then, um, I'm going to read something else in a minute. Next week, hopefully on this Sunday, we're going to have a great guy on this um, podcast, a guy called Chris Chambers, good friend of mine. Um, a best friend of mine actually is the best man at my wedding and I want him on here because he left the military he's deep into failure as well I love this he left the military he transitioned out and he went into uh, he started a business that's what we're going to talk about he's an entrepreneur he employs people um, very interesting very interesting guy so we're going to have him on here and we're going to talk about transitioning out of the military we're going to talk about what we're doing with our futures we're going to talk about being early 40s what that means I feel mid 40s now actually because I am mid 40s I'm 44 which is great the older I get, just the better life becomes. And I'm serious there. Yeah, I get aches and pains now. I didn't have when I was younger, but you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. It's all good. Okay, we've done that one. Let's have a look for the next one that we talked about, which is something I posted on Cora because someone had written, is being a fighter pilot really as romantic and awesome as it is in the movies? What are the downsides? And you know me, I'm a realist about this. Um, yeah, there's, there's good and bad things. I think I'll read you out my answer first and then I might talk around it at the end. I think Chris and I are going to chat about this because Chris uh, was a, a Lynx pilot and a Wildcat pilot in the Navy. Um, and he was an instructor. He was a display pilot as well. We'll go into that. He, we're going to chat about this kind of thing as well, about the glamorous side of aviation because uh, I was a naval pilot for only about five, six years. I just went through training. I never took a jet or anything to sea. And Chris took helicopters that land the back of frigates all the time. Very small helicopters, in fact. So um, we're going to talk that through. So here we go then. All right. Is being a fight pilot really as romantic and awesome as it is in the movies? What are the downsides? So my answer was, technically, I was a bomber pilot, but the term fighter pilot seems to encapsulate many different disciplines that utilize fast jet aircraft. I flew the Tornado GR4 principally for low-level strike attack, but we used it for many other roles too. 
I later taught air combat on the Hawk T2 and also instructed on the Hawk T1, so I guess I have a bit of knowledge. I served in the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force for 20 years. Firstly, being a fighter pilot doesn't suck. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you listen to a bunch of fast jet pilots talking in a bar, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it did. But they are just letting off steam. It's a busy job and their pressures are often seem unsurmountable. You soon realise after finishing a year of officer training, then three years of flight school, that is very hard and you can fail at any time, that being a fight pilot often comes secondary to the many other things that you have to do in a squadron to keep it running. You've got to plan detachments, run the officer's mess bar, organise the Christmas ball, be in charge of the kids' childcare centre, upgrade your qualifications, mandated training, nauseous admin. All these things are also assessed so that the seniors can see who is fit for promotion. Pilots can moan about these things because, to be honest, they'd rather just concentrate on the flying because it's difficult, right? But flying can also be a problem. Now, I was a flight commander and senior pilot at one of the largest flying training squadrons in the Royal Air Force. We had about 40 students and 35 instructors. Any other flying instructor on here will recognize that those figures are unworkable, and they are correct. We just didn't have enough instructors. You're supposed to have 1.5 instructors a student. We had less instructors than student at one point. So we had issues training new instructors because the civilian company placed in charge of UKMFTS, that's the privatization of the UK's military flying training, uh, they're called Ascent Flight Training, uh, they work out of Bristol. They were financially incentivized to output student over instructors. It was just set up that way. Nobody was really to blame, but it was a frustrating time for anyone flying on the squadron at the time. Student progress was sporadic, as was the instructor development, and my small team of instructors were flying all hours. Now, if you fly too much, you will become stressed. It's a brutal existence sometimes. It, it can be horrible. It's like a sausage machine, right? But eventually we had an intervention from a couple of psychologists who wrote a report into what the squadron was doing. It was pretty damning and eventually it shut down all student flying for six months. This allowed my team and I to train more instructors and to ease the burden on the few instructors um, who were doing all of the training. It was too late for many of the pilots. However, the damage was done and they left. They now fly overseas for a company who has benefited greatly from the inattention to their needs. Now, I'm out of the military, but you know that when I was in the military, I would have still said that there were people there who were at fault in this, that were, that were weak, and they should have done something about this because we caused a lot of good men uh, and women to leave the service early, and that, that should never have happened. I feel quite strongly about it, but this is not what the podcast is about. I'll do one about that later. Do, I've got friends in Ascent Flight Training, right? I do. But I, I was very disappointed by the way UKIM FTS was handled on both sides, on both sides, from their side and from the... Uh, from the MOD side as well. Okay, so there are good and bad sides like any job. If it was so great that no pilot would ever leave, the RF knows that you can only fly for so long before you get worn out. Now, when I joined, they offered a 12 or 16 year career. That's about how long it takes before you think about doing something else. I recently left, but when I see adverts about rejoining, I sometimes think back to the romantic side of it all. Like flying the tornado through steep-sided Scottish valleys at 500 miles an hour and at 250 feet whilst on night vision goggles. Then, as my weapons officer and I approached low cloud and with the moonlight about to disappear, I'd engage the automated terrain-following radar, bring up the flight director and activate the, activate the autopilot. The jet would steady itself down and into the cloud we'd go. Sometimes we'd see car lights on a road above us. I mean, looking back, it was surreal. One of only a handful of fast jets in the world can do that. The truth is, it was very hard work, and without the right temperament, you could get fearful of what you're doing. The Atlantic Ocean on the west coast, of, west coast of Scotland is just a dark trap, looking to swallow you up. You have to be careful. End up in the sea, and nobody's going to find you. Or I think back to the air combat sorties, uh, with great buddies and even better pilots. Taking three jets up out of North Wales, jousting away until you run out of fuel, land, debrief, and head off to the bar to tell each other how great we are. The stories never got old. The more we drank, the more legendary we became. Some of my best memories, however, are being able to help out a student who is struggling, being able to empathize and really get down to the problem, then working through it slowly, laying down the foundations necessary to progress on the course and finally seeing them pass out of the flight school and onto their frontline jet. I did 10 years as, as an instructor, that's too long, but I got to see a lot of my students return from their frontline tours and train with my team to become instructors themselves. So, as a summary, it's like all jobs, but like no other job. You have good and bad days. Sometimes your buddies die. Sometimes you might die. It's a journey, just one that demands respect, professionalism, and humility. It can be hellishly stressful, but also incredibly fun. 
It requires a level of commitment that you won't ever find in any other job outside of military service and you'll work with some incredible people. I wouldn't say that it was romantic, but just that if I was ever asked to go on a date with a tornado under a half moon ever again, I'd wear a clean flight suit and say yes in a heartbeat. So that's the end of that one. I just put out some core answers occasionally. People seem to like them. I'm not massively into Cora. Well, I am. You can spend so much time on Cora. It's amazing who actually writes stuff on there. It's not that I'm not into Cora. Sorry, I am into Cora. I just don't have the time to, to troll around um, and do these things. That's my computer making noises because I haven't really worked out how to shut it off and still be able to record into this microphone. Okay, so what else we can talk about? Let's talk about Aerialists. Okay, and I'm going to do a special podcast. I'm going to try and get some of the Aerialist team to come on the podcast with me. There's some fascinating people in this team doing some great things. You can go to aerialists.com. Um, if you want to have a look at the website, I did a lot of the narrative on that site and that's, uh, I'll spell it for you. It's A E R A L I S. Okay. So, uh, let's have a look at it then. What are we doing then? What is Aerolist actually about? Well, it is a flying training aeroplane, uh, with a high, about 85% commonality of parts because it uses the same common core fuselage. Uh, because that's got 85% commonality of parts, what it means that over 25 years, we can reduce the cost of training by about 30%. That is huge. That is really big, okay, in, in Trump's words. That is huge. That, that, is, that is large. That is amazing. Now, how do we do that then? As I said, the, the fuselage is the key here. The avionics is the key also, right? So the courseware, everything like that. What we're trying to say is, and this, I believe this. Remember, I was in flying training for 10 years. You don't need at this stage to go out and buy bespoke flying training airplane. And I will name some, uh, the Aramaki M346, uh, the BA um, Systems Hawk T2, for example, the 128 series that I flew. Um, you don't need to go and buy uh, KI T50. Oh, that'd be great. Uh, that'd be awesome. All those aircraft are great. Uh, they are lovely. And I was in um, uh, 346 at Farnborough. Uh, I think it's a great airplane. But it is expensive, all right? Here's the thing. What am I looking at paying for those aircraft? Up above 25 million pounds per airplane. Do I get any courseware with them? No. I get an airplane and it sits there on the line. I don't, at this time in my career, because a lot of the aircraft member were built to be not just flying trainers, but they could also be turned into like a fighter, like a, a low cost, well, not low cost, but a light combat aircraft in effect, all right? That's not what we're making with this airplane. This is a flying trainer. This is a classroom in the sky. This is a simulator where you can black yourself out if you get it wrong. That's what you want, is you want those environmental effects on you in something that is going to increase your learning. And we're going to do it through two stages. We're going to do it through two airplanes, although there's three airplanes in the fleet here, guys, and I'll explain what that third airplane's for about in a minute. We've got so the two aircraft that are going to do the flying training that are going to bring you the value at much lower cost. We're thinking unit cost per aircraft here is going to be 15 million. We've had studies into this, by the way, about viability. Um, and the reason it works is because the common core fuselage and the 85% commonality parts, as I've said. I'll tell you what's different with these airplanes as well. There's a basic trainer, there's an advanced trainer, and then there's something that we call the X, Aerialist X. Aerialist B, basic. Aerialist A, advanced. Makes sense, doesn't it? And then Aerialist X on the end. I'll cover that in a second. All right? So I'll go through the vision for you so you have an idea what we're talking about. Um, the company was founded on a passion to re-energize the UK aircraft industry and deliver market-leading aircraft and exceptional military pilot training affordably. I'm here in this company as a strategy director for them because I want to be, not because I have to be. All right? I work in other jobs as well, and you guys know that. I work as a contractor, an aviation consultant. I do a lot of speaking. I do a lot of other things. Uh, and as I said, I'm just here because um, I really believe in this project, and I'm an investor in this project as well. Uh, don't think I'm trying to sell you this, but you can invest in this as well. Don't worry about that. You, you can, absolutely you can. So and I, I want to talk to you a little bit about that in a minute um, because I think it might be an interest to some people. Uh, so I've got on the website here. You can have a look at it, as I said, when you get home, aerialist.com. So there's a common architecture between all these airplanes, between the A, the B, and the X, all right? The key is the fuselage. That's, that's the whole point of it, and the avionics. So the fuselage and the avionics are the same. In the B model, you have a center stick, all right? And you have straight wings, and you have one engine. I want to get that clear. Center stick, straight wings, one engine. Speed profile of this airplane, you're probably looking up to about 360 knots. That's the modeling we've done. There's been a lot of modeling in this, guys. There's a lot of engineering work happening uh, all over the country here. A lot of people involved in this. Um, initially, I didn't want more than that, really. I think that is enough. I think if you can sit at low level at 300 knots 
well, that's five miles a minute. That is, that's pretty sporty. If anything, you probably roll around low level, I think at about 240 knots in this airplane. Again, a very straight wing. All right, easily, easy. Well, I say easy handling. I think if anything, this aircraft's probably going to be uh, more dynamic in its handling than the advanced variant. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that, about that in a minute because a reason for that. So recoup on this, the B model. Speed's about about 360 knots. Think about A10, that kind of thing, SU25, you know? So you're not racing around with your hair on fire. It's manageable. Single engine, straight wing, okay? Undercarriage is the same. All that kind of stuff. 85, tail section the same, everything. A avionics is the same. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. What you see in the B, you see in the A. And there's people that are criticizing this, and that's absolutely fine. I want to talk about those arguments a bit later. Now we'll look at the A variant. This is the advanced variant, all right? I might run a competition to get some names to these aircraft at some point. This is the A. The A variant differs from the B, both twin cockpit, by the way, tandem seating. It looks like um, it's an exceptionally pretty aircraft. Let's pretend it looks like a Hawk, all right? Because then you know what a Hawk looks like. This looks like a Hawk. It's got a high wing uh, on the, than a Hawk, and it's got an intake sir, beneath the wing, and it's got leading edge root extension as well, because we're looking for a high alpha as well on this thing. Um, we really want to get uh, energy bleed, want a high alpha, get the nose pointer on this as well. So this is what's being designed, designed into it at the moment. The A variant differs from the B variant because it has not one, it has two engines. Now, also, it has a swept wing and it has a side stick because the difference between these two airplanes, now the speed range of this one is about five, the modeling suggests about 560 knots. It's a fast thing, it's slippery. All right, that's what we're looking at. Two engines, we're gonna derate them. The same engines are in all variants, so you're making cost savings on that as well. You've got one engine supplier now, one engine supplier. You've got one supplier for your whole flying training needs. And if you want your flying display airplane as well, or your companion trainer, because you're running F-35s, you come and you buy your X variant here. We'll sell you the X variant, all right? We can do that. We're not going to sell it to you, by the way. When I said sell, I don't want to sell it to you, and I want to talk to you about that a little bit in a minute. You're interested. I get it, because I'm interested, so I'm in the company. So here we go. So you've got the B, you've got the A. Who's going to buy what? Well, if you want to run a flying training system, you might want a B and you might want an A, but you're going to lease them off us, all right, because I want to back off you at the end. Uh, and the reason I want you to back off you is because the aircraft is modular, which means I can take your B variant back off you, and I can take your wings off. Um, I can take your, your, your if you think about the nacelle uh, on like an airliner, that is what is beneath the fuselage on this particular airplane. It's done because the, the whole modeling, the whole point of this is, is like, how come airliners can do this? How come Boeing and Airbus can run a fleet where, you know, a lot of the parts are the same. You're not waiting around for all your bits and pieces because you can't afford to. But if you buy one of these, if you buy an aircraft from, say, uh, let's have a look. What have we done in, in our UK military flying training system? Well, you come in, and the first aircraft you fly is from a Germany company, German company called Grob. Okay, it's called the Grob Prefect. All right, we call it the Prefect. It's actually the 120TP. It's a turboprop engine. As I said, it's from Grob. It's made by Grob. Then you do your course on that airplane. You then go to RF Valley, and you find that there's some Texan T6Cs uh, sat in a hangar because I don't think they can get certified yet. I'm not too sure what's going on with that. But um, either way, you've got 10 of those aircraft up there. They're made by a company called Beechcraft or Textron, um, as they Beechcraft, they formerly were, is now Textron. So that's a completely different company. Textron has nothing to do with Grob. Nothing to do with Grob. So now you're flying on this airplane from Textron. Okay, then you leave that airplane, you go across the other side of the airfield to four squadron and 25 squadron now as it is, and you fly the Hawk T2. That's the aircraft I was an instructor on. That aircraft is made by BAA Systems. I like the Hawk. I kind of even like BAA, BAA a little bit, okay, a little bit. Not a, not a great deal, but I like them a little bit, so that's all right. Um, I've flown their aircraft all my life. They kept me alive. I'm not going to diss the company. I like the company. So um, let's say then that we've got these three aircraft in your flying training system under something called United Kingdom Military Flying Training System, okay? That's what we've got in the UK. Three aircraft are different. You've got three different engines. You've got three different... Uh, every. I didn't even want to go into the bits and pieces that are on these aircraft, okay? But you've got to go back to three different suppliers. To, uh, there's no discount. in. You can't bulk buy. You know what I mean? Do you get what I'm saying? Do you get what I'm saying? If you were to buy... If you, in your airline, you just have Airbus, you have savings, if you have just Boeing, you have savings. You understand how that works. And the guys coming out and building this looked at the military um, market and said, well, that isn't happening. That isn't happening at all. How can we give a country a flying training system cheaper so that they can invest in their frontline aircraft more? Because frontline aircraft now are getting incredibly expensive, as I'm sure you understand. In fact, the Boeing TX, uh, Boeing said, and that's a great airplane, looks awesome. Um, they just said... Uh, 
we're selling that for 19 million, but we understand that we're going to recoup the costs later on in, in the through life support. Of course they are. All right. Of course they are. <coughs> Excuse me. Of course they are, because that aircraft is not 19 million pounds. That aircraft is in the territory of the T-50 and the 346 and it's up around the 25, if not over 30 million pounds worth of airplane for a training jet. I mean, seriously, have a think about that. It's a training airplane. A lot of this stuff now is going virtual, it's going synthetic, it's going simulated. And that's the thing about these two airplanes here as well. The whole Aeris, Aerialist fleet, by the way, is synthetic. There are no real radars on this airplane because real radars can cost up to about the third of the aircraft and they break. And when they break, you don't get to do your sortie. So like the Hawk T2, the radar is synthetic and the Hawk T2 radar never broke. And here's the thing that happened because it's synthetic, right? It just saw the Hawk T2s. You don't need to see anything else. When um, guys from the Typhoon came back, they were like, you know what? I wonder whether you can put something in your T2 radar to make it break more so it's more realistic about a real radar. That's the whole thing. And we're like, um, I don't know how to break the radar. But uh, anyway, so what I'm saying is you want to give the best training to the student you possibly can. You want to give them the most robust thing you possibly can. That's why you give them synthetics, robust synthetics. The avionics within the aircraft, we're going to keep the cost down with this because I want to, there's a simulator, there's everything else that comes alongside. There's other packages we're delivering and some of it's a bit commercially sensitive at the moment, guys, so I can't really go into it. But some of the things we're delivering alongside this, um, as you can imagine, is courseware. You, you buy the, you lease the jets, you lease the jet with the courseware. So there's avionics in the airplane that are the same. You're having massive costs on that. Commercial off-the-shelf technologies were being utilized to try and keep that cost down for the end user to get people through their flying training system. Um, and of course, you lease the jet for the length of time you need it. So you think, you know what? I'm just going to run a bunch of guys and girls through this on a basic. Well, you phone me up. Tim, how, how, how many basic trainers can you give me um, for about two years? I'll, I'll say, well, how many, do you, how many do you need? What's your budget? Oh, the budget is X amount of million. Well, let's start off with eight, eight basic trainers. I'm going to send you some instructors out there as well. I'm going to get you guys trained up on these jets. Uh, I'm going to send you the courseware. And then I'll talk you through what avionics you might need and what kind of courseware you're going to have. Because if your frontline airplanes in your military don't have radars, for example, well, there's no point you leasing my radar software technologies there. It's going to be of no use to you. So you get a level zero package with the airplane that has standard things on it, okay? That has your helmet mount sight, that has um, your head-up display, that has uh, hands-on throttle and stick stuff. It has your moving map. Has a whole, I've got a list somewhere. We can go through that. In fact, I'm trying to bring that list up for you right now. Um, I don't want to get too in-depth, obviously, because I don't want to get down the whole kind of bit where people are talking and saying... Uh, you know, and criticizing it and everything because they don't they don't know and I can't really explain it to you. Um, so I can't really explain it to you in huge detail at the moment because, of course, we're just working through uh, the people that we're working with, big businesses, to make sure that we have got everything we need. Right, level zero then, level zero tech. What are we do, doing level zero on the aircraft here? I'm just opening up this um, this document right now. So, yeah, you get a data entry panel, which you'd expect. Um, you get your large area avionics display, reversionary flight instrumentation, autopilot, mission management system, uh, your radios, uh, transponder, uh, TCAS, you get um, ground proximity warning system, the radar altimeter, ILS, VOR, that kind of stuff. Everything you'd expect, INS, GPS, everything else. The aerialist data link comes at level zero. Um, you get the health monitoring system on the airplane and a central warning panel as well. So level zero gives you a robust capability that allows you to teach your people on either one of these two airplanes. I can lease you a B, I can lease you an A, it doesn't matter, depending on where you are in your flying training system. Because obviously aircraft don't get removed out of a flying training system at the same time. Um, for us, for example, the Hawk T1 went out of service before the Decano. So if we were looking at Aerolist, what we'd say is, well, we've got Decano still flying, but I don't really have an advanced trainer. So Aerolist, can, you, can we lease some of the A variants from you? Yeah, sure you can. I'll do that for you. All right. I'm a generous man. What can I say? And then we'll work it out. Um, what else? Martin Baker ejection seats. Um, everything else you kind of expect something like this is where we're working. Okay. It's where we're working. So then if you, uh, you say, you know what, we have a requirement, Tim, um, we would like some enhanced synthetics. Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The, the enhanced synthetics are already in the jet. They're just not activated. That's just not activated. That's fine. I haven't activated them yet because you don't need them. Right. I don't want you paying for something you're not going to use. That's ridiculous. So if you're not going to use it, I'm not going to get you to pay for it. What we found on the Hawk T2, it wasn't a massive issue. It never really was an issue, but of course it could have been, was that um, when we gave well, two parts of the Hawk T2 course, all right, as you know, there was um, A flight and B flight, uh, where 
basically I was also commanding B flight and that was the weapons part. And then A flight was the advanced flying training. So A flight is where you learn to like drive or, you know, and then B is where you learn to race the car. So A flight, you get in the Hawk and you fly around and you learn your general handling, your nav, your instrument flying, your formation, your basic fighting maneuvers, your 1v1 air combat was also in A flight, okay? And then once you've kind of mastered that and you've passed that course, you come across to B flight, to my flight, and then you go through uh, your basic radar, your similar attack profiles, low level, your medium altitude level bombing. Um, you go through your evasion training, self-escort strike. There was advanced radar in there as well. There was air combat maneuvering, a whole host of stuff. You learn to use that aircraft as a weapon system. Makes sense? <clears throat> Excuse me. Right. So what we're saying is um, I'm going to – this is the great thing about this airplane because if – when you um, – you don't have to have this stuff active if you're just in a basic trainer. Because the last thing I want is your guys getting airborne on solos and activating the radar and playing. Well, they can't activate it because it'll be deactivated. But having a radar there, they can play around with. That, that's wrong. That's, that's not what they're there for in a basic flying training. You can have it if you want. I can activate that as part of your level one package. But you don't have to have that activated um, if you have two stages of flying training. You can keep the radar work on the advanced and on your basic, on Aerialist B, on the basic training, then um, you don't have to have all that stuff activated. What I'm trying to say here is that the B model can do everything. It's got a straight wing, it's got one engine, it's not highly dynamic, but it's a handling airplane. What that means is that you've got to, you've got to work at flying this thing. It's how you learn to fly fast jets. The A variant will be easier to fly. And it's going to have a very activated autopilot as well because it's got a side stick. You're going to be able to access the avionics. You're going to be able to move things around on that large area display. I want clearance for your hands to move stuff around. That's the whole point. It's about mission management uh, and, and, and systems prioritization on the A. The B variant is about learning to fly. So level one then, in basic synthetics, um, we can activate things for you on this airplane. So again, everything's not real, okay? It's synthetic. It's pretend. It's make-believe. That's why it works. All right, that's why it works. And on there, you, you can have things like rating, radar warning receiver if you wanted it um, at level one. Uh, we also come in packages, by the way. So if you say, Tim, I want to lease the radar warning receiver. Well, if you release, if you lease the package of that, or if you lease the EW and surface and missile embedded training package mode, uh, which you've got on there, then you get the radar warning receiver and you get the defense aid suite and the countermeasure, countermeasure dispensing system activated also under that because that comes as part of the package. You're saving costs by activating packages. Or you can say, I just want the radar warning receiver, Tim. And I'll be, okay, cool. Uh, okay, I'll just activate that if you want that. And then you can see other aircraft who, uh, who are illuminating you with their synthetic radar. But I might say to you, okay, well, there's growth there, isn't there? So once you guys are able to use the radar warning receiver and you're used to that, come back to me and, and we'll activate the um, defense aid suite on the airplane as well. And therefore they can simulate putting out flares and, and chaff and all that crazy stuff. There's flexibility in this whole thing. Um, and then there's a, so there's thing, other things in here as well. Um, so for example, level one, you might just want to have the gun activated so you can use some air to air combat or you might want to have the uh, infrared missile activated so you can do um, basic fighting maneuver 1v1, close in, stuff like that, fine. That's fine. If you want level two stuff, uh, this is advanced synthetics now. And again, we have packages up there and we're sort of, we've got an idea what these packages are. I'm just refining them to be honest, but you might say, look, Tim, you know what? I, I want a radar. I want the radar for this. And I'm like, okay, which radar do you want? Because I've got different variants of radar depending on what your frontline airplane are. And you say, well, you know, I'm running a frontline jet. It's kind of been antiquated. It's got a radar right now. I don't want to leap into some massively A-level, complicated, active, ele electronically scanned array. I, I'm not into that. I, I want to just keep the radar kind of, to keep, you know, for our guys just to work up to the frontline airplanes. All right, that's cool. Let me activate the, um, the multi-mode pulse doppler then. And with that, sorry about the computer beeping, with that radar then, um, I can activate that by itself. But if you activate the radar, what comes with that is a package. Okay, so you, it's a package. There's no point in having a radar not having any missiles to fire off it. So I'm going to give you the basic element of that package, which is um, a stores management system. For a start, you'll have that now. Uh, incidentally, if you get the gun or the IR package, because you'll have a stores management with that as well anyway, because you have to, because you know you've got some stores. Um, but also I'll give you a semi-active radar homing missile with that, with that multi-mode radar. And I'm also going to give you a solo air-to-air -air embedded training mode so you can go up against your buddies or you can go up against, sorry, not go up against your buddies. You can go up against yourself, all right? And you can train with yourself in sanitized airspace, all right? Under a radar service, hopefully, so you're not going to fly into anyone. But um, we've got that working now. 
Uh, there's some really great stuff in here that I don't really want to tell you about because obviously it's commercial and sensitive, but it'll come out eventually. Um, let me give you another one then. That's not too sensitive. Again, you don't have to, uh, let's have a look here. What else? Oh yeah, so you can get a precision guided munitions um, store if you want. So I can give you PGM capability. And with that, you get the stores management system. I can give you maritime package, anti-radiation. Uh, what else can I give you down here? Let's have a look. So we're just working out with the helmet mount site right now what we're, what we're doing with that. Um, but that can I can give you an H&D with targeting mode, which you wouldn't have as standard. So I can I can activate that. And then there's a lot of other stuff down here. And then there's a level X, which is level zero, one, two, and then an X. And with X, I don't want to talk about that because that's getting into something that we call live virtual construct. And that's, um, that's very sensitive in the company at the moment, okay? Cool. So I've given you some taste then of what you get when you lease one of these aircraft. The B variant is the slightly slower one, um, but it's it's there. It's a it's not the easiest aircraft to handle, which is great because it's a center stick and it's how you learn to fly jets. Um, the A variant it's a lot more easier to handle um, because it's harder to operate. If that makes sense. It's harder to get in the systems. It's harder to work out what you're doing and, and actually prioritize the uh, the mission that you're on. Um, the B variant one engine, twin engine for the A. Okay, twin engine for the A, swept wing for the A. And again, these engines are, are potted. This is um, painted technology, right? So they're potted as they would be on an airliner. So uh, underneath the airplane, that's, that's what it is. And uh, again, you can see these airplanes on the website. So because we have this, um, because we have the commonality of these aircraft, as I said, there are these huge cost reductions that can be made. And then with those cost reductions, we put that straight out to the... Um, to the customer again, of course, that's the whole point of the leasing model. And of course, when you activate one of these subsystems, so you call us up, or all of them are activated remotely, of course, airliners do that now. And you say, I want to activate, what did we say we had? I want to, Tim, um, my guys have been flying this B model for a while now. Um, we, we think we want the basic, uh, the BFM course, the basic fighting maneuvers course. I say, okay, well, we're going to send you out one of our instructors to make sure that you do it properly. Um, just to give you a hand, he'll just be an advisor. He doesn't have to fly if you don't want him to. He just stay with you for a couple of weeks to make sure you know what you're doing. And I say, right, when do you want the uh, when do you want the infrared missile and the gun to and the stores management system as part of that BFM package? When do you want that level one package? When do you want that to start? They say, Tim, I want it to start on the first of June. I say, right. So what are we looking at now? A couple months ahead of that. I'll tell you what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to activate the courseware one month ahead of that date. I'm going to let you get right into it, all right? And then on the morning, when you walk out to those airplanes on the 1st of June, on that morning, you'll get in that airplane, uh, by the way, and the the um, that the infrared missile and the gun are going to be available under a stores management system. And here's the thing as well. When the courseware is activated for you, all right, when the courseware is activated, um, at any time from that point, you can act we can activate it in the sim as well, all right? So you might say, okay, well, that's really cool. I'll train the guys up in the sim. Um, so, Tim, uh, uh, the courseware has been activated a month before. Can I activate the sim at the same time? Of course I can. It's live for you, all right? And there's a guy out there to make sure you don't go and kill yourselves. And there's online training for you to do as well. If you want to reach back to the company, the company's here to help. That's the whole point. The company's here to help. We've written the courseware. And that's the whole point. The courseware is written for you. Now, this is where it gets a bit problematic. This is great. I love talking about this. I'm happy to take questions. It gets a bit problematic for you, uh, for some people, because some militaries can't see them training in any other way but the way they train, if that makes sense. You have to understand that these airplanes are to be developed by pilots and instructors from Her Majesty's Royal Air Force. We taught a lot of other air forces around the world and also other instructors from other nations have input into this and is still making input into this, by the way. The training is generic. It's not secret training, all right? It's not, everything is, uh, as I said, it's open. It's an open source stuff, okay? This is what it means. It means... You have generic missiles. You can have something called a long-range missile. You can have something called a fully active radar missile. You can have something called an infrared missile or a short-range missile, medium-range missile. It doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. You can say, well, that's it's got the same or similar ranges to an ASRAM. Well, maybe it has, or an AMRAM. Yeah, maybe it has, you know, but it's but it's not got the same ones or the same technology in there or anything else, all right? It's a generic active, radar-active missile. That's what it is, generic. So you guys can work on those. The, and this is the thing, because, of course, you have to remember that the majority of your tactical training is done on the front line. It's done on the operational conversion units, and we're going to input into those. So you get your basic and you get your advanced flying training courseware. And each one of those courseware, as I said, can be activated. So you don't have to have, you don't have the capability for advanced radar work. Well, don't activate the, the advanced radar. 
you don't act why would you what are you going to sit there you're going to pay me for it and i'll be like guys listen you're not even using this and it's costing you money i want you to not turn it on and off every week you know what i mean i'm saying if you're a score who's training people in air combat let's get that radar into your jet all right let's get those missiles into your jet let's get the gun into your jet with the stores management system all right that's what i want in your airplane let's activate those fairly so you know where they are they're there for you you've got them all right, and now you can go and uh, you can use them. Let's get that radar warning receiver in there as well. Let's get the defense aid suite. These things I need to be activated for you because you need to use them. So if you ask me for the uh, for the radar courseware, well, yes, and with that comes activation of these services. Okay, so that's how we work these things out, and we do that individually. So militaries can still operate on a very individual basis. They can also they can decide the level that they go to um, that they actually want to fly to with their students. But it means that they don't have to shell out a whole world of money for something that they're never going to use. Because we don't want that. We want people coming back to us again and saying, we love the product and we want more of it. We love the product, Tim. You know what would be great? If I had a tactical display on my airplane. I've got a tactical display package for you. I've got the courseware already written. I've got the tactical package. I'll activate it tomorrow if you want. But let's get it in the sim first. Let's get you guys read up in the courseware. If I need to, I can send out an advisor for you, a guy who's fully swept up and trained in uh, in the tactical display. I can send out videos now for you if you want so you can see what the tactical display is. I can show you the benefits of it. Um, I can show how it's helped out other militaries around the world. If you want to activate that, I can do it for you, all right? It's going to lease you the attack display. It's absolutely fine. That's what I'm talking about. So that's the theory behind all of this. And then I did say that I'd speak about the... Oh, I, I told you about problems. I've got cramp my leg. I told you about... Um, if, uh, uh, military sorry saying about the issues with this of course because a lot of militaries will be coming back and i understand why this is i know a lot of people around the world i speak to them other instructors and they're saying but tim you know our military trains people differently i'm like well probably badly if i'm honest with you it probably doesn't train them as well as you think it does and they're like well okay fine but we're flying pick an airplane we're flying rafael whatever you know it doesn't matter what it is. we're flying gripen doesn't matter what it is um you don't know anything about these airplanes. Uh, this training is not the same as doing the front line. I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I get that. I get that. And it doesn't want to be as well because this is an education system you're buying here. We're going to stretch your pilots further than you've ever been able to stretch them before. We're taking them so far. We've got psychologists involved in this, nutritionists involved in this. We've got um, we've got physical trainers involved in this. I'm going to be, some of the packages you're going to have on your courseware for ground school involve mental health. When was the last time you talked to your students about that? Thank me later. That's absolutely fine. I've done that for you. I gift that to you. That, that comes with the jet. Okay, that's a level zero package for you right there. Ground school is free. It comes free with the airplane. All right, of course it does. And in that, you talk about physical, mental health. You talk about the correct nutrition for your people so that when they fly, they're optimized to perform. Now, I did this for 10 years. People are working on this. I haven't even added up. Haven't even added up the amount of hours we yet have involved in flying train that's going into this airplane. This this thing here is a game changer. And I'm not saying that because I wouldn't be in this company working for these people if I didn't fully believe this. They came to me, all right, and I said, "I'm really sorry. I'm very busy." I remember the first piece of work for them I did. I was like, "Seriously, guys, I'm really busy." And then I got to know the team, and I was like, "Wow, this is this approach to flying training has not been done before." All right, this had not been done before. The great thing about this as well is you can take a base that's about to close, hashtag Scampton, let's just say, and you can, let's just say, you can put 10 of these on the flight line at Scampton. You can put 15 instructors on these airplanes at Scampton. And then you get other people's air forces sending their people over to you and you've got spare capacity now. And that's a problem in the world at the moment. All right, that's a problem. Now, I'm not going to go into so much of the investment area of this, okay? But I will go into some figures real quick for you. Um, and uh, by the way, this is not us making stuff up. We um, invested in an incredibly expensive, I say expensive, incredible, incredibly valuable is what I meant to say, incredibly valuable um, a report into whether there was a necessity for these airplanes. And the truth is there is. There's some pictures on here as well of the cockpit area. I'll go and have a look at that if I was you. It's an end-to-end -end flying training system, as I've told you about. It's got digital learning management system within it, remote courseware updating. Um, it's got a common simulator that will cover all your types. One sim. This is crazy value. I like feel like a used car salesman here, except it's not a used car. Um, so this will take you all the way from, well, here's the thing as well. So I'm not saying it takes you from elementary to the OCU. That's that's not the case. I wouldn't want you jumping in the B variant. That's still a very potent flying training system. That B variant is 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 not your PC-21. 
All right, we're talking, you know, that's a great airplane, by the way. I know guys flying out there on the Pilatus PT-21. It's a lovely airplane. But this is a this is a jet. It's got a jet engine in it, all right? Um, it's, you've got to be careful of these things. So I want you to have some kind of elementary training before. Yes, you want to go and do that on a Cessna. Yes, you want to do it on a Piper or a Grob or something. Fine, get yourself some hours, and then we'll put you in the B variant. From the B variant, you can work into the A. In fact, if you don't want to, you can probably go from something uh, small and light piston into the A variant, um, but I wouldn't activate all the courseware and I wouldn't activate all the avionics on it just yet. I really would not do that. And of course, there are things we're looking at now as to whether we can give you an A variant with a center stick, which I'm sure can be done, but of course that comes at cost and certification issues and everything else. All right, let's have a look. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the... I'm not going to take it with time, guys. Probably another, I think another 12 minutes and we're done. Um... So it's a whole training ecosystem. That's what we're delivering you right now, okay? So it's the family of aeroplanes. The X variant, well, this is when you come to us and you say, Tim, I love what you're doing, but um, you know what? I want a radar in my airplane. And I'm like, you idiot. Okay, fine. You want a radar? Fine. I've told you not to have a radar. You want a radar. I'll give you a radar. And we'll go and select a radar, something small, um, whatever you want, and we'll put it in the nose of the airplane. But guess who's going to pay for the certification of that aircraft? Yeah, you're going to pay for that. Or maybe several of you coming together, several companies, uh, countries, sorry, coming together, or several aggressor companies coming together, and they're like, we want to do aggressor training with this aircraft. I need an actual radar warning receiver. I need an actual radar, and I need to be able to carry a pylon because I want to put a self-protection jamming pod on there or something like that. Well, let's do that. You're going to buy an X, an airless X. Airless X can have one engine, two engines, sweat wing, straight wing. It doesn't matter. All right, we can do that, but we've got to certify that. That's what the X is for. You want a bespoke aerobatic team jet. X, not A, not B, X. I'm helping you out here, guys. This is exactly what X is for. That is exactly what X is for. So the Lisa will buy combinations of common core fuselages and different wing engine modules because the wings and the engines, they're modular. Uh, um, basically, you lease the desired combination of variants. You say, I want, um, I want, let's say, 10 Bs and I want six As. All right, let's do that. It's a small flying school, small flying school. Small but powerful with a very, very robust spares chain. Um, and then when you're done, you return the aircraft to us and we're going to reconfigure those airplanes. Everyone thinks it's going to be done overnight. It's not. It'll probably take about 18 months. But um, what we can do is we can take the wings off a of B. We can turn it into an A. We can turn it into an X. doesn't matter. We get that aircraft back out again. So you can flex your fleet. All right. That's the key. We can accommodate your short-term training needs is the key here, guys. All right. There's stuff on the website then. So uh, what else are we looking at here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're reading stuff on my website now while well, I wrote most of it. So just I want to take away, I want you to take away this then. So it's flexibility, reduced operating costs, 85% commonality of parts and engines typically means 30% lower cost. Uh, that's been independently verified, guys. I'm not saying this. What's that you want to invest? Of course you do. Actually, it's interesting. I did invest. Um, my wife and I, when we put, well, we put about 20,000 in because when I left the Air Force, they give you some money, right? They give you, because yeah, I did 20 years. I did 20 years. Um, so I came out and I was like, I said to my wife, I said, look, let's just put some money into this. You know, I, I believe in this company. I was working for them for a while before I did this, by the way. I was working for them for a few months before I saw the value that this this company actually had. And I believe in this company, which is why I said to my wife, let's invest, let's invest in this. This is at an early stage. This is really early on. This is the second round of investment we're looking for now. Um, I said, get in. And she was like, all right, let's do it. Let's do that, she said. So um, we're in. If you want to get in, on the website, there's um, the shares are AIS approved for UK investors. Um, as I said, it's the first modular jet training system being developed in the UK. On the investor page on the website, it tells you what uh, the issues are. It shows you the airplane. It's all there, guys, all right? Um, it was Fraser Nash did the consultancy. It talks about the Common Core fuselage. It talks about the markets we're going into. I don't think it has the figures. But the I don't think it has the figures. The figures there, the figures aren't there, guys. They're on um, Syndicate Room. So you want to go to Syndicate Room. I haven't opened that page now, my desktop. EIS shares, though, it's the Enterprise Investment Scheme. It provides tax incentives in the form of a variety of income tax, capital gains tax reliefs to investors who invest in smaller, unquoted trading companies, especially ones with such a beautiful airplane as ours. Um, but if you do want to get in, involved in investment, you're going to speak to a guy called Nick Bertel. All right, he's a great guy. He's going to help you out. He knows a lot about investing, actually. Quite surprising, uh, I must admit because I, I don't, so I'm not advising you to invest at all. 
I'm not, I'm, that's not what I'm about, right? I'm just saying if, you, if you're not happy with the stock market at the moment and you want to follow something very closely and you want to get invited to brilliant evenings where I come and chat to you and we have a few beers and a laugh um, down in London, this is what you do. You invest in it. We have investors' evenings. We talk to you about the airplane. You see exactly where your money's going. You come and see the factory. You come and see it being built. It's a hands-on approach, guys. This is awesome for you. So um, that's why I'm thinking about you guys. Um, and yes, so then you go to the syndicate room. So syndicate room is, is online. It's a website. You will have to create like a login, uh, but that's cool. It takes two seconds. And then go on there, search for Aerolis, A-E-R-A-L-I-S, um, and you'll find it. And then go and read stuff on there. They've done the due diligence on there. It's all there. Um, and I'm hoping you're quite excited about it. As I said, I'm going to put more out about this. But then again, I don't want to, I'm not tainting fast yet performance here. You understand that this is what I'm doing now is uh, I'm doing many, many things. One of them is I'm trying to change the way we do military flying training across the world. Okay. That's purposeful across the world because I believe it could be done better. And yes, you might do flying training different, differently to the course where we put out, but I bet you this course where is better. I bet you it takes you further than you could ever go before. And this airplane will have a higher level of synthetics and training that's been done by psychologists and educators and teachers to stretch the performance of your student, to stretch them. Allow me to do that for you and you can concentrate on the frontline stuff. Okay, I'm going to, they'll be your instructors, by the way. Of course, they'll be your instructors. I can train them for you, but they'll be your instructors. All right. They'll be your airplanes on lease. You don't want to own airplanes anymore, by the way. They're getting too expensive. It's ridiculous. Who wants to own these airplanes? Um, and that's pretty much it. So what have we talked about then? Yeah, go to the website, have a look, guys. So we spoke initially, then, didn't we, about this young guy who was a commercial pilot and he's struggling with confidence issues. And we just said, look, it's about, it's all about getting yourself exposed as much as you possibly can to that environment because it brings your nerves down. And we understand that. This is what psychologists do if they have someone who has a phobia. They have they introduce them to the thing that makes them scared and they do it slowly and they build it up. I live in a house with a lot of spiders. I hate spiders. There's a spider right now on my hall. Uh, it's got a hole in the in by my bedroom door. Big black spider. All right? It's, it's there. I see it. When I come upstairs, he goes back in, or she goes back into the little, little hole it's made. And I just say to it, get back in your hole. Now, when I'm not here... He can come out, and apparently they normally are male spiders. Male spiders tend to go and hunt. I've, I've deep dived into this. I've read about spiders. Um, they go out and hunt and stuff, and that's so we have an agreement, right? When he feels the vibrations on the on the stairs, he gets back in his hole. That's where he goes back in his hole. But I expose myself to these things so I can become less less worried or agitated or anxious about them. So this guy we said here with the flying, he's agitated on his flights. Well, of course he is because. He's getting in the cockpit. He's seeing all these dials and everything. It's not a familiar space for him, is it? So he needs to become more familiar with it. Even when the jet's on the ground, get in that cockpit. Some of our students at Valley, uh, when the jets are in the hangar, they'll get in the cockpit and they'll run through their checks in the real cockpit with their gloves on uh, because that's how it's going to be for real. All right? They're in the real cockpit of the airplane with their gloves on, touching switches. Obviously not starting the jet, but they're touching switches, all right? That's called chair flying. If you've got an interview, chair fly it. A difficult conversation with your wife or your husband, chair fly that conversation, all right? Chair fly it. Difficult boss, you've got to go and speak to them. Chair fly it. With a friend, if you want to, it's even better. And then we spoke a little bit about um, is being a fighter pilot really as romantic and awesome as it is in the movies, what are the downsides? And I spoke to you about those kind of things and I about doing train following radar at, at, at night um, and that there's a there's, sometimes it's just hard, but it's, it's not a bad job and you last about 20 years of it. Uh, and then you start going and having mental health problems, which obviously we've all been through there, haven't we? And I talked about the problems with UKM FTS at Valley at the time, which we went through as well. And then we spoke about Aerolis. Uh, and I like to keep you guys informed on that. And as I said, there's an investment opportunity there for you if you really want to get involved because we get to be on a journey together. I think that's pretty exciting to be on a journey like this, unless you can find someone else who's building military fast jet flying aircraft in the world um, at this cost. So I can't. Uh, I can't. So it's fine. And um, what we're not is, is someone, let's just say Big Prime, who is um, like a big oil tanker. We can move quickly and we are moving quickly because we have to. That's exactly where we are. So, and you can see what kind of funding we have already. We're looking for about 2.7 million to get the Common Core Fuselage designed. That's not just a demonstrator as a Common Core Fuselage. The technology we put into that will be in the real aircraft. All right, and we're going to take this to a, um, a defense conference next year. 
uh, and it's going to be there. Come and see it. It's going to be massive. This fuselage is going to be big. You, you're going to see it. You're going to be standing next to it going, whoa, I didn't realize it was this big. All right, this is a real thing that's happening. Um, we've got virtual and augmented technology at that conference as well. Um, so I really want people to come down. I'm going to talk a bit more about that. You come down, seriously, have a cup of tea with me. It's going to be awesome. That's in London, by the way, next year, uh, late next year. So, uh, but the technology you'll see in that cockpit is going to actually be in the airplane. That's the whole point. This is not something where we put a little mock up. I'm not saying anyone did that at Farnborough. Everyone did it at Farmer, didn't they? Um, what you see at this conference next year is real. Real. That's why the money's going into it. And then that, this is the second round, guys. When we close out that, that's what we do with that. And then the third round, um, we raise more money to actually build a flying demonstrator, which will fly for about 400 hours, something like that, whatever, and then we'll scrap it. But it's going to demonstrate the capability of one of those two variants. I know which variant we're making. You don't know which variant we're making, and that's fine because we're going to keep that under wraps for the moment, all right? But if you want to get in, get in. If you don't want to get in, and here's the thing, I get that. You don't want to get in. Just follow um, Aerialist Jet on Twitter. That's me that's doing that, by the way. And I'm kind of trolling a little bit with it as well because that's what we have to do on Twitter, right? Uh, also, there's a Facebook page, Aerialist Jet, as well. So get onto that. Guys, I'm going to separate Aerialist. I'm going to separate Fast Jet Performance, obviously, because they are. We've got lives out there, but Fast Jet Performance, I'm talking about everything on Fast Jet Performance. I'm using in Aerialist as well to try and really enhance the, um, the, the ability to deliver something of such capability that it fundamentally changes the way we train uh, fast jet students in the future. In fact, all students, because the B variant can be used for um, basic flying training before you go into rotary or multi, and that is the plan, by the way. Okay, guys, thank you for this. I really appreciate being able to get stuff out of you. It's been like an hour. Uh, if you listen to all of it, okay, you are solid, all right? And I love you muchly, as you know. Whack some comments down in the old um, Facebook thing here so I know what you're liking, what you're not liking. Um, Put some hateful stuff down. If you want, get it off your chest. It's fine. I can take it. We'll have a bit of banter. It's all good, all right? I, that's what life is about. It's just the internet. It's not real. All right, guys. Thanks so much for your time. All right, Tim Davies, Fast Hit Performance. <laughs>